We all know design matters. I happen to think designers matter too. Hey everybody, this is Business of Design. I'm so glad you're here. We are going to have a lively conversation with a man named Eric List you who is from Living in Place Institute, and we're going to talk about a subject which I came to thinking was about dealing with clients who are older, my age and older, who are moving into homes and want to feel safe in their homes. And I left the conversation understanding that we are all aging and we all want to feel safe and comfortable in our homes. Thanks to Eric. I think you're going to find this an interesting conversation. I also am really excited that every single thing I learned on this episode is something that can be applied to my business today and can be part of why I charge what I charge because it's going to increase the value of the homes I'm working in on behalf of my clients. So, wow, this was such a win. Eric and I are going to talk about five places that are key for us to be thinking about in terms of safety and comfort in homes. None of these is going to be a big shock to you. We're going to talk about that front entrance. We're going to talk about the powder room, the kitchen, a staircase, and the master ensuite areas of the home where accidents can happen and where a little thoughtful preparation can reduce the number of accidents that happen. So it's all good. I am currently in my 50s and I happened to have really good eyesight and didn't need reading glasses until I turned 53. Suddenly I needed reading glasses and I could not wrap my head around the image of me fishing through my purse, digging out a pair of old granny glasses and putting them on so I could read a menu in a restaurant. Too vain for that, not for me. And glasses are so fabulous. There's green glasses and black ones and red ones and thick frames and thin frames. What a fun accessory. So I immediately went to an eye doctor and got a prescription for reading glasses, but put them into amazing, great frames. I've only been wearing glasses for a few years and I love them as an accessory. I love how much fun they are. And yet I really only have a prescription in the bottom. So the vanity is still important to me and that translates into our homes as well. I now can see clearly that a client is going to bristle at the idea of a grab bar in the shower because she's active and vibrant and goes on cycling holidays and does not see herself as a quote unquote senior. Having a new language for the value of adding that bar in the shower is life-changing to me and I love that we got there with Eric. I also had an opportunity to be on the other side of bias recently. I went to a yoga class. It was a teacher I didn't know, and I arrived at the class with someone who's a very close friend who's tall and thin and looks like a yogi. Let's just put it that way. I'm not tall and thin, and I do not look like a yogi. And the teacher came over to us and introduced herself to my girlfriend and then to me. And then she laser focused on me and said, have you ever done yoga before? And I said, yes. And she said, well, how much yoga have you done? And I said, lots. And she said, well, this is a level two class. And I said, yeah, not a problem. And she wouldn't let go. And then my girlfriend intervened and said, what's the issue here? Why are you concerned about my girlfriend's ability to do this class? And I was singing, she's concerned because I don't look like someone who does yoga. And it was so uncomfortable. I felt somewhat embarrassed. I can tell you that. My girlfriend felt embarrassed for me. And we gave each other a look like only two girlfriends can, which is like, I'm going to slap this girl. And she finally moved away from me, did the class. And after the class, she came up to me and she said, I need to apologize to you. I'm, I'm really embarrassed about my behavior. You were awesome. Clearly, you know, you could do this class and a higher level class. And I have no idea what came over me. And I know what came over her. She made an assumption by looking at my body about my ability. 
And I realize that I make assumptions by looking at someone who looks older about their ability. And this conversation is about how unproductive that can be and how it can get in the way of thinking about that person across from you as a human being and not being able to know anything about that human being by just looking at them really. So good reminders. And if you're ready to do yoga with me and you're in Santa Monica or Toronto, let me know. I'll go with you. Cheryl is having a much needed holiday break today, so I'm going to fill in with announcements. Just a couple, two things we would love for you to attend. First of all, we are having our Business of Design Elite Retreat. This year, it's going to be in Santa Monica, California. That's my home turf or one of my home turfs. Can't wait to show you around. The Elite Retreat is a combination of intensive learning, well-being, and an opportunity to recharge, refresh, and reset your energy for the year ahead. There is some pre-homework. We ask you to dig a little bit deep and see what you need to learn so we can tailor the learnings. There are some breakout sessions. There are some sessions that go deep in terms of vulnerability, where we really share intimately about what's going on in our businesses. And I look forward to the retreat so much because I know I'm going to come away with renewed enthusiasm for the work that I do. I hope you can join us. It is October 24th to the 27th. It's $2,899. It's a business write-off. If you're not in the habit of taking those business vacation write-offs, this is the year you should think about it. I would really love you to join us. We will do some intention setting. We will follow up the intention setting and check in on you during the year to see how you're doing. We're going to do some ridiculous fun things. We will tour homes, private, beautiful homes. And fingers crossed, I think we're going to Malibu Soho for our farewell dinner. Soho House is a private media-only entertainment club slash restaurant. If you belong to one Soho House, say in Toronto or West Hollywood, you belong to all of them, except for Malibu. Malibu is very special. It's standalone. Almost guaranteed celebrity sightings. Last time my daughter and my husband were there last week, they saw Miley Cyrus and her dad, Billy Ray, and they also saw Liam Helmsworth. Uh, I might have had a hard time not asking Miley to sing Jolie because I think she's got such a beautiful voice when she does that song. But anyway, we'd love for you to come to the Santa Monica Elite Retreat. We haven't done a conference since 2015, and so many of you are asking, when's the next conference? I have an answer now. It is January 2020. It's going to be in Las Vegas, and it will be combined with Las Vegas Market. So if you haven't been to High Point Market in a while and you're thinking you would like that market experience, this is an opportunity to combine intensive learning and a market experience. The dates are Saturday, January 25th and Sunday, January 26th. Really important, the market does not start until Sunday. So we will be there in advance of market and by the time we're finished with our two days, two very full days of intensive learning, you will be in a great position to tackle the market, source for clients, and implement the learning and strategies we're going to teach at the conference. We're setting the cost for the conference shortly, so stay tuned for that, and we will give you some updates on what the itinerary will be, but you can expect it to be no theory, all business information you can use. So put those dates on the calendar for us, will you? Business of Design, Santa Monica Elite Retreat, October 24th to 27th, and then Business of Design Conference, January 25th and 26th. That's 2020. So much to look forward to, including this conversation with Eric Listew. He's going to break down 
a typical project into five key areas you want to think about if you want the homes you build and decorate to be the most comfortable, the most functional, the most beautiful, and the safest for all your customers, regardless of age and stage. Let's get into the show. Welcome to the Business of Design podcast with Kimberly Selden. Business of Design is the coaching community for independent designers like you. We know it takes more than hard work and talent to successfully run a professional design firm. There are proven business strategies that can solve your immediate challenges and transform your life. Don't try to do this alone. Join today and you'll have access to more than 100 video courses, participate in monthly coaching calls, and find unlimited support within our exclusive members-only Facebook group. Unlike traditional coaching, BOD is a fast track to immediate results for independent interior designers, decorators, architects, stagers, and landscapers just like you. Monthly membership is only $79. Annual members save two months and have access to Kimberly's contracts. What are you waiting for? We all know design matters. At Business of Design, we think designers matter too. Eric, where are you this morning? I am in a community of Colorado called Nederland. My daughter lives here. Uh, it's a mountain community up about 9,000 feet, and it's a gorgeous, stunning place. Ooh, 9,000 feet. Are you? Do you feel that? Where do you normally live? I live at about 7,000 feet, oh. so this doesn't bother me. Eric and I met at Cabus this past February, and Eric did me a huge favor. I didn't have a badge, and I was required to be out on this stage. I was on a panel, and I was in a bit of a panic, and you like took the badge off your neck and got me into the show, and I was Eric Listo, which was really cool. <laughs> well, you look like a pretty honest person, and I can tell you were a little stressed out. I was doing the same thing, not for a badge, but for a different reason. I was pretty stressed out, and those people were helping me. When they said they couldn't help you, I thought, yeah, but I can. I have a badge. And uh, and as you have seen me now, usually my face gets in me in the most places. Most yeah. people say, yeah, yeah, he's good. Go ahead. He's, he's <laughs> honest and trustworthy. This guy's got my back. But anyway, I appreciate that so much. I'm so happy we met, and I love this topic. And uh, first of all, tell us what living in place is. Living in place is its not a new idea, but it's a new mental shift to a very simple but complete approach to making all homes accessible, comfortable, and safe. It doesn't matter what a person's age is. They deserve a safe place to live. It's all ages. And Let's not insult our clients. If we really think about it, what we're talking about, and I know I'm just being a, a dope here, repeating exactly what you said, but it's just, this is such an amazing conversation because it's just dawning on me. All we're talking about is making our homes comfortable and safe for every single client, period. You're exactly right. Rather than trying to divide our industry, and if we look at the whole industry, new construction and remodeling, that's the division of housing, right? You're either a new builder or you're in the world of renovation. Why try to divide it up by every potential age and ability? You'd have millions of different groups. So let's just stay where we are. Uh, we've learned to do things better. Uh, the energy world, we're, we're so much more energy conscious. People don't walk in asking for specific energy features in the home. Mm -hmm. They might say, I want my home to be energy efficient. Well, yeah, of course it is. That's what I do. Right. So if the client were to ask, well, at my age, I need my home to be maybe a little safer. You just answer, well, of course, <laughs> that's, all, that's what I do in all my projects. We want homes to be safe at every age. It doesn't matter. Okay, can you think of five areas of the home where we could spend a little more time and attention and make a real difference in terms of comfort, safety, and home value? Yes, and, and maybe the way to think of that is to actually approach. Okay, I'm walking up to the house. So the first area is walking in the front door. <laughs> The front door, all commercial spaces, there has to be a no-step entry. Now, many times there are stairs, and we can't get around that. Well, that's where you make sure there's sufficient lighting. There are two handrails, 
and a space and the electrical necessary for a future lift, whether it's a seat lift or a wheelchair lift or an incline lift, whatever that device might be, just make sure that it's ready for that. So that's the entry. Do I even have to tell my clients, I'm going to make sure the staircase is ready for a lift? Or do I just say, let's make sure there's power top and bottom of the stairs? And if they ask why, there's, are there more reasons? Like potentially if someone wanted to add a lift for Christmas lights, that's a good reason to have power for the lawnmower, for... That would, those are great answers. Yes. Yeah. So you can plug in your Christmas lights and you just say, we always do this. We always do it this way, but be prepared. If the person says, well, when I get older, then you say, yes, in my training as a professional, I've learned the value of preparing for the future. So not only is my design preparing for changes, my colors, my cabinetry I've chosen you are all preparing for as those things age, we're making your home so it's safe for you and your family and your grandchildren to come visit. Okay, love it. So right off the bat, the entranceway, the lighting, non-slip surfaces, no stair entry if you can, or at least a big landing before you step into the house. Seems to make sense to me. Okay. And no threshold on the door. Why? Why walk up to a door and all of a sudden there's this big threshold. We don't have thresholds in our between our rooms. Commercial buildings don't have thresholds. So we're almost at the point now where the only place a person has a threshold to step over is at the front door of a house. And because those thresholds can be different, if you walked into 10 different homes, you're going to step over 10 different types of thresholds. So Again, rather than trying to train your consumer about the threshold you provide, just buy a door without a threshold. Is there no good purpose to have a threshold? I always thought it was like, oh, it's going to keep dust out or keep wetness out. or. Well, they do that. And from the commercial door industry, there's things called automatic door bottoms, where when the door closes, the, thresh, the weather stripping drops down into place. And even if there is a little air blowing through under a door, uh, you know, when you open a door, it's, it's a phenomenal amount of air you let in and out. And as we've learned from our earlier mistakes, now is part of that, building a home super tight. Now we know there's a lot of advantages to letting a house breathe. There's actually some code requirements for air exchanges in a home. So the, the door industry can provide you with a door that does not have that problem. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So that's the front door. What happens when we get inside? What's another area? Well, let's, let's, uh, like many people do, let's, the first stop is the bathroom. So let's go right into the bathroom. Okay. And which is where most accidents occur. So the first is the door. How wide is that door? I'm not going to talk about a person in a wheelchair because that's, that's only 1% of our population. Let's instead talk about and ask the question, is that bathroom door wide enough that I could carry my grandchild comfortably and walk through that doorway? And to do that, it's probably going to be a 36-inch door. Now, which way does that door swing? If the door swings into the bathroom, and while I'm in there, if I slipped and fell, and it's this bathroom, I'm probably going to be close enough to that door where no one can open the door. It's going to take a rescue team to come open the door. So think of that door should either swing out, which can be a problem with swinging into the hallway. Why not either a, and I like these sliding doors. I hate calling them barn doors. A sliding door that sits outside of the door. Uh, And the industry has come up with some pretty neat hardware now that lets that sliding door recess back into the door opening, kind of like cabinet doors do. At the very least, a pocket door. But there's a hazard in pocket doors that traditionally they slide all the way back into the opening. Then you have that little tiny metal piece you have to try to fumble with. Well, instead, use an oversized door Stop the door about six inches short 
from recessing all the way back, then you can put a big vertical handle on that pocket door that's attractive, easy to grab, and easy to close, and very intuitive. Thank you. Very smart. I love that. When they come up with a way to acoustically make those barn doors better or those sliding doors, I'm in. But we haven't been able to quite figure that out yet. Well, I didn't get a chance at the Builders Show and the Kitchen Bath Industry Show two weeks ago to look at them. But I understand now there's hardware where you could attach it to your existing bathroom door. So the bathroom door, the way it operates, it pulls out from the frame a couple inches and then slides down along the wall. Then when you pull it back, it nestles back into the opening. Cabinet doors, a few years ago this was launched, and I understand it's now available for residential doors too. I love it. Good. Okay, yay. So that's a big one. That's that powder room that you're talking about. Um, should we go to the kitchen next? Because that seems yeah, to me to be on right. the... So we, we, we're done in the bathroom. We, we're walking into the kitchen. Now, let's think of the flooring we're walking on into that kitchen. Kitchen is usually a different flooring. What we're going to talk about briefly is color contrast. If we go back to thinking about that example of standing on a cliff and feeling uncomfortable, if the cliff... We, we have something in our brains that we call depth perception. So our brains figure out what is a hole in the ground. So if you walk from a light colored floor to a dark floor, your brain will think that dark area is lower and you'll try to step down. You'll assume it's a step down. In this country, we've learned at a very young age that most floors are flat even if they change colors. But what happens when we forget that? Maybe we've taken some cold mess and we're not thinking, or we've stayed up late studying, or we're an older adult who is not thinking. Let's think about a person who's experiencing dementia. They forgot that that dark area is not a hole, and they'll try to step down. When they misstep, they will fall quite often break a hip, that's, that starts this tragic, rapid decline, typically, in, in a human being. So as designers, let's think of the color differences when we walk into the kitchen. We want a low color contrast. And would you like to know how to determine that? Please. You can go through a, a laborious process of bringing in some of vision experts and colorists, or you can simply take your color chart from the paint store, and each color has a little number on it, a number between 0 and 100. That number is called the light reflectance value, and in this case, we use that to measure what, what amount of contrast is there. So when you take your color deck, your paint chips, and you match the hallway color to the kitchen floor, if it's more than a 20-point difference, that will trigger your brain to, oh, it's a different level. You need to take a step here. So again, terminology. Don't stand in my room and say, Eric, I know you like this light color floor in your kitchen, but I'm telling you, Eric, a man your age is going to fall. Well, I don't want to hear that. So that's where you have to use the terms you use. Well, I think this is the right blend. This helps the floors flow from one room to another. I'm trying to talk like a designer now. But, you know, this brings in the elements of the kitchen and lets your cabinets stand out. Yeah, I I completely understand this. And I think that I, in my mind, I thought contrast was good because... It allowed people to know that there was a change. It didn't occur to me that, uh, um, that it creates a depth perception problem, though. That's super interesting. Right. So color contrast can also be good. So now, uh, not sure about you, but I remember once rushing into a kitchen with a, a stack full of fresh pies, and, I, and the phone was ringing. This is back before cell phones. And for the young people... There used to be phones that were hung up on a wall, so you had to go over to the phone. So I set this stack of pies down on the counter, turned around to grab the phone, 
As I said hello, I heard the pies hit the floor. Well, I missed the edge of the countertop just a little bit. Now I know that that was probably because there wasn't enough contrast between the cabinet and the countertop. So now my brain couldn't quite figure out where the edge of it was, and I guessed. Mm. Instead of my brain saying, there's sufficient contrast, I know where the edge of the countertop is, set these pies down, you have dessert for a week. <laughs> <laughs> you lost me at a stack of pies. Who has a stack of pies? <laughs> I've never had like I've never had a moment where I'm running in the kitchen with a stack of pies, Eric. I like how you roll. Well, I, I stopped to help some gentleman whose truck had broken down and he was standing there looking perplexed. I pulled over, I said, again, before cell phones, I said, can I give you a ride somewhere? You're obviously broken down. Well, he worked for some big pie company. So when I dropped him off, he insisted I take a stack of pies. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Okay, so what other things are we thinking about in the kitchen besides contrast? Uh, uh, let's let's think more about that countertop. So now we have the sufficient contrast. Is that top of that countertop a high gloss finish? That's what most people have gone to is high gloss finishes. Well, first of all, when it's a high gloss, you can't see the beauty of the product. That's the selling point. But that high gloss will reflect lights into your eyes. Now, a 60-year-old needs about three times more light than when they were 20. So a person 60, that light reflecting, our eyes are already dimming down by 300%. So my eyes dim a little bit more, and now I'm not really seeing. I'm blinded. Uh, it creates an after image. Medical people call it a veiling reflection when that reflection hits your eyes. So the countertops, nice matte finishes, leathered, honed. I'm finding my clients every age are asking for matte finishes or leathered finishes or honed finishes. So that's nice. That works. That's an easy sell. Yeah, and I, and I have to wonder, is that because when people have the option, the brain says, I like this one better than that shiny one? Maybe, yeah. You know, so we're learning from our clients too. What? Any other thoughts in the kitchen? Oh, I could go on for days about the kitchen. But <laughs> <laughs> I would think so. It's a dangerous spot as far as I'm concerned. In, in general, lots of lighting, uh, task lighting, general lighting, uh, appliances that can be reachable. So the oven door that drops down to almost the floor, put a wall oven in. Uh, use induction cooking, which not only cuts your energy 70% by using induction cooktop, it's also not a hot burner. That works if you have little kids in the house as well then. Absolutely. Probably once you start going down this rabbit hole, there's a ton to learn. Yeah, there really is. It, it's it's a lot. Our industry, we we all need to educate ourselves much better than we have because it's up to us. It's our responsibility to make homes safer. If we wait for the consumers to ask, they're not going to be here to ask. Right. I mean, literally. Wow. Literally, they won't be here. Okay, well, we're moving out of the kitchen. What about that big master ensuite? I know we talked about a bathroom. I assumed that was kind of a powder room. Are there other things to think about in a big master ensuite? Yes, master bathroom. Again, minimal floor contrast walking in, plenty of lighting. Stepping into the shower, uh, stepping over that little curb that will eventually rot out. I think everyone is on board now with the linear drains and the no-step shower concept. It's interesting. The times that I have suggested to clients, for example, that we install grab bars in the shower, if they are 50 and younger, they sort of act like, no, we don't really need them. And then I'll say, well, what happens if you bust your knee while you're playing soccer? Or, you know what I mean? What happens if you, you know, break an ankle? Why would you not have, what happens if your mother visits? What happens, you know, like why would we not have our homes ready for inevitable aches and pains and sprains and assistance? Well, that's a good approach. And, and we often suggest just what you did. Um, do you have any family members or friends that might have challenges? So we want to make sure it works for them. But here's a suggestion. Don't call it a grab bar. 
Oh. When you called it a grab bar, if you were my designer, my first thought would be, what are you talking about? How old do you think I am? Wait, do you really know I might be that age? So I'm questioning these things. I'm not really listening to you anymore. Instead, if you were to suggest to me, Eric, we're going to put this beautiful towel bar in your shower so you can hang a wet washcloth, you'll love it. It's going to be beautiful. Okay, so it's about even how... Even the language I use. But if it's a towel bar and it's on an angle, what's my client going to say? Well, why would you put it on an angle? Okay. Oh, so here's something I don't know. I just look at grab bars or towel bars, whoops, and think they're on an angle when they're inside the shower. Well, what people often do is they'll put it on an angle. They've really done that so they can hit the two studs. They'll take a 24-inch towel bar, and the studs are 16. So, But the problem is the installer will say, we put it this way so maybe it's a bathtub area. So it's easier for you to grab that angled towel bar and pull yourself up. So there's no benefit, there's no ergonomical benefit to putting that bar on an angle for someone to use? Well, there could be an ergonomic benefit in grabbing and like successfully pulling yourself up. But remember, your hand's wet. You're making an enormous assumption on the, on the ability of that person's hand to hold on. There's, there's many, many variables there. Instead, just install that, what we used to call grab bars. Let's, let's install that bar on a level line, about the height of a standard handrail. So between 34 and 38 inches is the optimum height. That makes sense to me that I I think I could sell that. It's partly about confidence, right? Just being able to say to the clients, "This this is our strong recommendation. Our clients love the following things. You're absolutely right. We should talk about stairs. Yes. Uh, Some of the same rules, plenty of lighting, lighting the handrail, lighting each tread. So as a designer, if you're designing a space that includes a stairway, design in a complete handrail system that goes completely around the stairway on both sides, extends on the top and the bottom. So at the bottom of the stairs, you don't get that feeling of, am I done? There's no more handrail. The railing levels out and continues down the hall a little bit. So a person has a chance to orient themselves. And I've been shocked watching how children will respond on handrails like that. They'll put their hand up and they'll hold on to it. So yes, it's for all ages. As long as we're talking about staircases, let's follow that thread all the way through because that's an area that we all agree needs particular attention in terms of safety. So a handrail that extends all the way from the top to the bottom makes sense to me. What are the other things we need to do automatically in stairways to make sure that the people who use our homes are safe? The biggest, one of the biggest problems on a stairways is seeing the difference in the, each step. It's almost always the same color, whether it's wood or carpet. Carpet's a little softer to fall on, so we usually recommend carpeting stairways. And light and shadows plays somewhat of a role in us being able to see the steps, but those lights and shadows change throughout the day. They change whether you're walking up or down the stairs, the light's different. So what we need to do is not only better lighting, and better lighting can include lighting inside the handrail. And what I've been suggesting lately is put in lighting inside a handrail and have it connected to a backup system so that if the power goes out in your home, your stairway light handrails light up and make your stairway maybe the safest place in the house at that moment instead of being the most dangerous. Other things you can do on a stairway to see those treads, uh, there are paddings and nosings you can put on. One simple trick is to buy carpet runner that usually has a long lineal pattern etched into it. Cut that into three foot wide strips, the width of your stairs, and put it on each step sideways, if you will, so that that pattern that used to go up and down, now goes crossways on each step. It gives your brain the ability to see and to go, oh, 
my brain figures out where the step is. I don't feel like I'm stepping on the edge of a cliff. I can see each step and I'm comfortable. That will help reduce the chance of a fall. That sounds like as simple as contrast, right? Could you also have a um, darker step and a lighter rise? Would that help at all or not really when you're going down the stairs? It would help going up. Yes, definitely. But going downstairs, no, it wouldn't. You mentioned also lighting on the bottom, on the stairs. We're now putting um, a small light at the base of the staircase, like near the stringer, I guess you would say, or in the stringer sometimes. Is that a helpful place to have light as well? Well, think of when you're on the top of that stairway, if that light is brighter than everything else, bright lights cause our eyes to close down a little bit. So if the person is at the top of the stairs and sees that brighter light at the bottom, it'll actually diminish their vision. So we need those to be quite low voltage. Yeah, low voltage, um, light on each tread, like underneath each nosing, an LED strip light. I mean, we're talking about things that are nominal cost, just phenomenal in the look. It just makes it look stunningly beautiful, obviously increases the value of the home. But most importantly, it makes a person comfortable on the stairs. And as I said earlier, if you feel comfortable, that means you're at less risk. I love just general praise from clients. And I imagine sitting in front of a client and doing a presentation and getting to the conversation of the stairs and say, we also are proposing lighting under the handrail, lighting at the nosing. Here's why we're doing the carpet runner like this. All of those things just make me look like I've been very thoughtful and very thorough thinking about this project. So none of this is bad for us as designers to start thinking about. You're right. It it gives a designer a, a little differentiation. Because if you were to use those words to me, and I've interviewed half a dozen designers, I'm probably going to say, wow, nobody else mentioned that. I like that idea. This has been a fascinating topic, and I'm assuming some of our listeners are going to want to know more and study with you. What can they do as a next step in terms of furthering their education? Well, take every class you can on this topic. You know, learn, learn, learn. You know, if if the ideas about color were important to you, take a class on coloring. If the concept of depth perception is intriguing to you, then find a class from the medical industry on depth perception and understand that. But to really capture the whole essence of this, there is really only one training program that covers all of this. And yeah, I'm the co-founder, so I'll divulge that right up front. But this is something that's not only important and embraced by, oh, I think seven different broad industry associations, this training is actually endorsed by the National Kitchen and Bath Association. What is the training called? The training is called CLIP, C-L-I-P-P. CLIP means Certified Living in Place Professional. It's a 16-hour class, and it costs $12.99. We do offer various discounts, anywhere from nominal discounts to professional educators, accredited educators and students, they get an $800 discount because we're passionate about let's train the youth. The 16 hours can either be in an on-location two-day class, two days of eight hours, very intense, full immersion, or it can be online six days of three hours. And the online training is not where you turn your computer on and You hear Eric rambling in the background while you go do your laundry. No, it's live interactive. You're actually seeing the class on the screen and you're seeing every other participant all at the same time. So you can talk and chat, really make sure everyone understands the materials. Yeah, this is not something you want to do in your sleep. You, I, I'm interested in this, and I, I love being able to add value to the conversation I have with clients. To me, this makes a lot of sense, especially because a lot of my clients are repeat customers. So we're doing their second or third home, and in some people are referring it to this is my last house, so it has to be incredible. So if I can learn things here that I can translate into their next home, it's a win for me. I can recoup that money quickly. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's say you're interested in taking the CLIP 
training, how do we find you? Uh, the easiest way is just to go to livinginplace.institute. Very simple, livinginplace.institute. And in there you'll find, under the heading classes, I think you can find all the different classes. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. I think this is really important. And uh, if you're in your 20s and you think it's a long, long time before you have to think about any of this because all of your clients are also in their 20s, you couldn't be more wrong. So give it some thought. Seems to me it would be a great niche as well or a great niche, depending on where you live. Well, thank you so much. This is great work that you do. We like to end every episode with something called design intervention. This is a nugget of wisdom you have learned in running a business. It does not have to be related to the conversation we just had. It could be completely random, but something you've learned that's been invaluable to you in business and you're thinking our listeners really must, if they're serious about their business, do the following thing. One piece of advice I'll give, and I remember when I was young listening to these old guys giving advice. Now I get to do it myself. So here's my piece of advice. Smile and look at the positive of everything. Everything, whether you're designing, whether you're having a conversation with your client, whether you're checking out at a gas station, smile and be positive. Watch the effect. People will like you. They'll trust you. They'll be positive. Okay, that's good. I can do that. That seems like great advice to me. Thank you so much for this. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much again for that badge. You saved me at Cavis. Well, isn't that what we're all there for? To help each other? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for being a part of the Business of Design community. If you love what you hear on the podcast, take the next step by signing up at businessofdesign.com. As our thank you, you'll gain access to Business of Design's 15-step project management strategy, a free introductory course which includes three Business of Design systems you can implement for immediate results. And when you're ready for success, a Business of Design membership, monthly or annual, will dramatically improve your business and your life. What are you waiting for? Together, we will achieve extraordinary results. Start today. Start today.